All right. <clears throat> well, Steve, thanks for inviting me. I remember well that visit 10 years ago. <clears throat> we were indeed just getting going. Actually, we had started uh, sometime <laughs> the better part of the preceding decade. Um, <clears throat> but we were not very far along when I came down to see you. Um, <clears throat> I think the proposal that made DASH possible, and I'll just be very quick with this, <clears throat> Um, I submitted to the NSF, the National Science Foundation. We knew we needed external funding. This wasn't something that uh, the observatory was going to be able to do on its own. But I should say right now, I've been very grateful to the HCO, the Harvard College Observatory, that um, we've had all the support that we've had. <clears throat> and I'm going to say it right here at the outset that I should have put it on this, this title slide that this talk really should be dedicated to Steve and Ray. You guys were really wonderful. Uh, you're gonna appear in a picture in just a few slides, so we'll, we'll uh, celebrate that. But <clears throat> for all of you skyscrapers, um, we really uh, had an enormous boost from Steve and Ray coming in every Thursday, was it Steve? Marty? Yeah, we were on Thursday so that we could yeah. uh, Shoot the breeze with Ed Lost because that was the day he chose to come in as well. Uh, yeah, well, the three of you. And Ed, of course, is absolutely indispensable, as you know, and as I want everybody on the skyscrapers to know. As are a couple of other people. Uh, I'm going to come back to them later, but since I've already started on this, I'll just say it now that Bob Simcoe, who designed the scanner and the plate cleaning machine, and uh, you know, those were indispensable. I mean, the project wouldn't have happened without the scanner. And we're still scanning. Well, we'll get to that at the end. But we're, we're getting close to the end. That's the good news. We expect to finish by this summer, summer of 2021. And so Bob Simcoe, and of course, now Lindsay Smith, who is the curator of the plates. You'll see a picture of her in a bit. And her predecessor, Allison Doan, who was a wonderful longtime member of the observatory staff and died from that terrible disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, ALS, uh, just awful. But we, we uh, owe a lot to what Allison did to get this whole thing going. Okay, enough of an introduction. Let's get started. <clears throat> and let's see why I'm not advancing my slides. That's interesting. Okay. I'm gonna move the photo gallery of you folks over off on my other screen. So this is what we're gonna do. <clears throat> and I'll try to finish in you know, 45, 50 minutes or so. So I'm gonna go through some of this fairly quickly. <clears throat> we're gonna start with what DASH is, um, how it works, and that may be what many of you are most interested in. But <clears throat> I hope you'll be interested in some of the science we're doing. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that this project can do. Uh, half of the data <clears throat> are in the public domain. The remaining half, and this is in round numbers, uh, will be fully available by next summer when we release, when we finish and we've reprocessed all the data. But what I'm gonna talk about is one of my own particular interests, uh, which is with black holes. I've always been fascinated by black holes, probably some of you are. I mean, they're <laughs> amazing objects, as we probably all know. But um, <clears throat> there are black holes that are in binary systems. And some of them are uh, systems that you would find on the AAVSO website. Not many, but a few. And <clears throat> so one of the motivations for this 100-year look at the sky that I wanted to do, and lots of people wanted to do, with the Harvard plates, uh, which I'm gonna show you very quickly some, uh, some bits of, um, have had a, their very origin with Pickering, we'll get to that in just a few minutes, uh, for wanting to understand variable stars. That's where it all began. You know, why did Harvard, this sleepy college in the 1800s, not a big university yet by any means, start uh, building telescopes, and uh, not only in Harvard Mass, but in Peru. I mean, my God, this is incredible. I'll get to that in just a bit. But uh, the black holes in binaries 
are fascinating and we do not understand where, how they are formed. That's one of the primary motivations that I had in wanting to do Dash. But I also wanted to do it to get this incredible database available, make it available to the world. Because otherwise you had to come to Harvard and spend a couple of weeks and laboriously, you know, with a magnifying glass, stare at glass plates. And you would do one or two objects. But what Dash has made available is the entire sky. Uh, all the plates, all the imaging plates are what Dash is all about. So, um, and what I'm going to mainly talk about when we get to the science are the black hole systems. Okay, <clears throat> so I've already mentioned that the HCO has a very large collection of plates. It's the world's largest. Um, we didn't know how many plates exactly. We knew it was roughly 500,000, and indeed it is about 500,000. I'm not going to give you the precise number now. We are only interested for DASH at, at the moment at least, and we probably won't have time to do beyond this, with the imaging plates. That is the full uh, <clears throat> photographic plate. Most of them are eight by 10 inch glass plates, about an eighth of an inch, three millimeters thick. <clears throat> And, but we are now, in fact, we're, we're finished with all those. They're in round numbers are 400,000 imaging uh, glass plates. We can tell you exactly how many, Ed can speak up later and look in his notes and tell us all what the precise number is. There are also smaller plates, four by five inch plates, and we're now scanning those. And those will be uh, followed up <clears throat> with the real, um, grand plates of the collection, the A plates, which are 14 by 17 inch glass plates, big plates, same size as the polymer plates. Um, we, when we began the whole project back in, when we had the scanner up and running by about 2006 or seven, uh, we went through, as I'll show you in just a minute or two, uh, <clears throat> all of these plate series, not the small ones at that early stage, but we did the eight by tens to make sure we knew what we were doing, and that the scanner was doing what we wanted it to do. And we verified that we could scan the big plates, that everything <clears throat> would work with a different top end on the scanner. So <clears throat> the plates are, um, whoops, sorry. I'm not, for some reason, this is kind of strange, able to, here we, okay, now it's working. Uh, the plates uh, cover 100 years, actually 107 years, if you want exact, 1885 to 1992. There may be a few in 93, and I don't think there are any before 85. I thought it was 86, but I got a note from Ed not long ago saying 85, okay, well. And, and as I've already mentioned, the thing that is incredible that uh, that Pickering, who I'm sure many or most of you maybe have heard of, this director, very imaginative, Harvard, uh, got him from MIT, where he'd been doing physics, the Pickering series. That's the same guy, Pickering. Um, <clears throat> so he wanted to understand variable stars. And so it wasn't just making a catalog of the sky. He wanted to repeatedly image the sky, and he did it with very high resolution plates, these A plates, the 14 by 17s, low resolution, that is arc seconds per millimeter on the plate, <clears throat> uh, patrol plates, and those patrol plates are not as deep and they're not the high resolution, but they're extremely useful for time variability because those cover very wide fields of view and there were lots of them. So if you wanna look at an object that gets moderately bright, where that will be say 12th magnitude, which fortunately the black hole binaries that I'm interested in typically do reach. Whereas in quiescence, you don't have a prayer of seeing them on, even on the Harvard plates, they're 21st magnitude or you know, 18 or 19 in some cases and some of the A plates do go down that deep. But <clears throat> the amazing and unique feature of the Harvard plates is that they, they cover this uh, a century, uh, 107 years, and they're covering the full sky, <clears throat> northern and southern hemisphere. That's the part that I just still marvel at. I hope many of you, <clears throat> and if not most, then please go out and get the book on Amazon, have read Davis Sobel's book, The Glass Universe, which is a beautiful description of the Harvard plates. <clears throat> it's a wonderful book. 
And another book that I would recommend is very, that came, David's book came out about two years ago now. There is a new book out on Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, which I just finished reading um, <laughs> this last day or two. It's a beautiful book by Donovan Moore, and you can, you can get it on Amazon or your favorite bookstore. And I strongly recommend that you get that book, get both of those books if you're interested. So here's what the HCO looked like <clears throat> around the turn of the century. I won't take the time to point out, you know, what of those buildings is where we are operating today. Well, actually I will mention, I assume you can see my mouse on the screen here so I can point. Um, so that's, that's, build, that's the building where the plates are in. And this, uh, this was, this image must have been taken in the early 1900s. That's the great refractor there, the 15 inch, which is the beginnings of the Harvard Observatory. It has a twin in, at the Polkovo Observatory outside Moscow. And we'll, we'll stop there with the, with the history. So, <clears throat> so I think I've covered all that and I won't take the time to talk about this telescope. And I've already mentioned uh, that the, uh, it was so brave of Pickering to <laughs> literally from the beginning, from 1886, they were in Peru. They hold telescopes up on the top of a mountain near Arequipa on the backs of mules and set up an observatory. So it was just amazing. So <clears throat> you know, my down arrow does not advance slides. How interesting. And to continue with the history, just very quickly before we get on to Dash, this is an early picture of what the plate stacks looked like. I'm not, I don't know how many of you have visited. Uh, again, the invitation is open for any of you who want to visit and see what Dash or the plates look like. But of course, right now we can't do that because we are closed due to COVID. I haven't been in the plate stacks for months. <clears throat> Ed goes in every week, more or less, but I haven't been in there for a while. I am going to come in soon. So there's a long history with getting the plates here. One of them one shipment of plates was lost to a German submarine. Uh, so, you know, incredible what was going on. And of course there's Pickering and here are the women computers that you can read all about in David's book. Uh, and, you know, the, the real star of that group, there were many of them, Annie Jump Cannon, who did the first classification and was a remarkable person. And of course, Henrietta Leavitt, who discovered Cepheids. And her discovery of Cepheids enabled Hubble, Edwin Hubble, on the 100 inch uh, on Mount Wilson uh, near Caltech, where, uh, where the discovery was made by Hubble that the farther away a galaxy was, the faster it appeared to be receding from us. So the, the whole expanding universe and the concept of redshifts was really fundamentally possible because of Henrietta Leavitt. Somebody else would have discovered Cepheids, but she did first and with the Harvard plates. <clears throat> so there is you know, roughly 500,000 plates, 300 tons of glass. The building, which was designed by Shapley and completed in 1932, was, was specifically built to house the plates. So there are steel girders running through the the three floors to support all that weight. It's a good thing. And if you haven't been, this is what you would see. And it still looks like this because we haven't moved the place and they are not going to move. There were, there were times when various groups were hoping to get us to move the plates, Pari in particular in North Carolina, but uh, that did not look safe in the long run. So they're staying right here until, and I'll mention this now, this isn't something that is going to happen for quite a while, but probably in 10 years, the observatory, <clears throat> because of expanded size and because the buildings are so old and out of code, that um, there will be a new spot for the observatory. That's way in the future, at least 10 years, probably more like 15, but it's, it, it will happen eventually. Here's what a glass plate looks like. And I don't know how many of you have worked with glass plates, uh, but uh, you know, they're photo negatives, of course. 
And <clears throat> what the uh, observers did to do variability was to have, <clears throat> and I should have zoomed in on this image, but to have a star of interest, which I will assume might have been this bright thing, which looks more like a galaxy than a star. But and when you see a surrounding group of things that are uh, numbered with numerals, one through five or whatever it might be, <laughs> I can't begin to read that here, those would be reference stars that were not the variable of interest. And it was image diameters that, because the longer you expose a star or expose the plate, <clears throat> the more grains are uh, turned from, uh, from transparent uh, to, to black. And they, therefore, the image diameter increases. And so the image diameters were measures of magnitudes or brightness, and, but they had to be calibrated, calibrated against stars whose magnitude you knew. And you had no, in the early days, the photoelectric magnitudes, of course, hadn't been invented yet. The photo tube didn't come along until the 1920s. So it was all image diameters, and it's remarkable that they could do the work they did, except by comparing for a given star what its diameter, image diameter was as a function of time, you had relative magnitudes. Putting them on an absolute scale was much harder, but that, of course, eventually happened. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to look at, to make use of the plates, you had to put them on, uh, in fact, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't what you're seeing here. This is a light table, as you can see, and I'm going to get back to Allison in just a second here. But in 1885, well, I think the, I think Cambridge got its first electric lights, you know, Edison and all, in the late 1880s, but I'm sure the observatory had none. So when the women were measuring image diameters and therefore doing science, which was what it was all about, they were doing it with glass, uh, easels like this in front of bright windows or some artificial bright light source. But I think it was mostly done with daylight. Uh, somebody can correct me if that's not right. But this is Alison Doan, uh, who I mentioned at the beginning, I uh, want to honor. And this is, this is what a typical user of the plates, and there were many hundreds. Um, I don't know what the total is. I uh, should ask Lindsay or somebody who could tell me the total number of people that have made use of the place, but it must be in the thousands, I'm sure. <clears throat> but it was very laborious, that, that's the point. And you would do one plate at a time, you might spend the better part of a day, or at least several hours at least, making measurements on a single plate. And of course, you wanted lots of plates if you're trying to do things as a function of time. So <clears throat> that um, is all of this uh, incredible database sitting there for over a hundred years. Well, time domain astrophysics, I'm sorry I left out the hyphen here, that should have been here. And, um, and it's, it's, it's such a big part of astrophysics today that like everything else, it has its own acronym. Some of you may have seen this, TDA is all over the place. And it's become a major field, but it's never been possible on hundred year timescales. So let's do it with NASH. And there are lots of very much more sensitive surveys going on today. Pan stars that some of you may have heard about back in the 90s. <clears throat> the Palomar Transient Factory in astronomy, as you probably know, we just love acronyms. Uh, nobody can take, spend that extra tiny bit of time to, you know, spell it out what it means. <laughs> so, uh, but PTF going on, uh, well, PTF has now been succeeded by ZTF the Zwicky in honor of Hans Zwicky, Zwicky, hard name to pronounce, but a remarkable astronomer, um, is the current uh, successor to PTF and is doing wonderful things, uh, covering a big chunk of sky uh, every night. And all of these things that have happened over the last 20, 30 years, which are, I'm only listing two of them here, are going to be, of course, totally blown away by uh, something I'm sure most of you have heard about, LSST. We now call it the Rubin Observatory in honor of uh, Vera Rubin, uh, who is such a remarkable astronomer that she was at the Naval Research Lab, discovered dark matter. 
she, she and others were, had made comments that pointed to something like dark matter, which we, of course, still do not understand. We do not know what dark matter is. We just know it's real. It's there. And so the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory is now doing a legacy in, in space and uh, legacy survey in space and time. So, you know, there was a great effort made to preserve the acronym of LSST, which everybody has known about for the last 20 years. Anyway, LSST every night will be <clears throat> going very deep and will be mapping a good chunk of sky every, every night. So the data that is coming is, is incredible in the data that we now have, but nothing on these long time scales. So to do DASH, <clears throat> we had to make use of calibrators. We, we could basically do the same thing that Henrietta was doing, measure image diameters, but except with modern tools, S-Extractor, software package that some of you may have used or heard about, that is the, is the standard in astronomy for how you measure magnitudes, images on, on CCDs today, but it is still perfectly usable on, on photographic plates. So what, where, where would our standards come from? Well, fortunately, back when we were trying to get this whole thing going, and as I said, the first proposal went in in 2004, if I'm remembering right, the only full sky catalog that had any real quality was the Guide Star catalog for the Hubble Space Telescope, which was made by digitizing the polymer plates. The whole polymer plate series was digitized uh, it took five years to digitize 4,000 plates, and we now digitize 4,000 plates in, uh, or can digitize them in, in, uh, in a month, uh, of order a month timescale, because of this scanner, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, being very fast and very efficient. And it was this all sky database we still make use of. It was succeeded by something that the um, AVSO is involved with, the APAS catalog, which again, some of you may have used, it, and it was based on CCD photometry, so it's much more accurate than the, uh, <coughs> the Guide Star catalog. So, okay, lots of reasons to start now. There's LSST, which I won't take the time to describe. I've already mentioned it, but it's well along in, in building. It's on Cerro Pachon, right next to Cerro Tololo in Chile. I've been at the site a couple of times. It's a beautiful site, just like Tololo is. And this thing will have its first light image, I'm almost certain, in six months from now, or in 2021, I believe, is when it will get its first look at the sky. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I've already mentioned a lot of this, so I can breeze through this slide. But uh, again, we, we have um, lots, of, lots of reasons now that we didn't have even 20 years ago why we want to do this. But my reason for wanting to do it was the fact that <clears throat> things that are very rare, rare transients, and I'm sure all of you know that Novi are very rare. They typically are only seen once. There are recurrent novae, but there are a very small fraction of novae. Well, black hole novae, and when they were discovered for the first time uh, as x-ray sources that looked in their optical, very similar to classical novae. Um, so they were called x-ray novae, and that turned out to be a terrible name for them because they have nothing to do with normal novae. A normal novae or nova, like um, any nova that you may have had experience observing or looking at for whatever reason. Uh, I remember always, uh, not always, but there was a very bright nova, beautiful nova up in Cygnus in, in uh, 1976. Um, and I, I, was, <laughs> I was a postdoc working for a few months in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is not exactly clear sky country. You know, it's pretty cloudy most of the time, not always. But I remember having this beautiful look, naked eye, you know, it was fourth magnitude or something. Very, very bright. Um, Nova. Uh, and 
you know, they're, they're very rare. So, but so are the black hole novae that we're going to talk about, which we no longer call black hole novae. We call them black hole low mass X-ray binaries. So that, that low duty cycle, fraction of the time that you get to see something is why you need a long chunk of data to see anything at all. And there are lots of things though that are uh, very good arguments for uh, having the Harvard plates digitized. You get to look at things that recur on very long time scales. Obviously, if you only have data that covers 10 years, well, that's all you get to see. You've got 100 years, you've got a wholly different view. Um, nature is parsimonious. If you want the very biggest, brightest things uh, like novae, well, you only get to see one, one round with a nova, unless it's the rare class of a recurrent nova, which you might see every 10 years. The same is true with the black hole uh, X-ray binaries. They produce enormously bright optical and they're discovered not, they could be discovered in the optical and they were in fact. <laughs> One that was discovered, I'm gonna come back to later in 1938 was called Nova Sig 38 because it was assumed to be a classical Nova. Well, it's not, it's, it's a black hole. It underwent this Nova-like outburst and it's one that we're particularly interested in because it is sort of the the uh, prototype of the whole class. So there are huge amplitude flares. <clears throat> if you like to think in magnitudes, which I'm sure you're all you know, very familiar with, um, let's take Nova Sig. It is in quiescence, it's actually quite bright in quiescence because it has a, a giant, a K, a K giant companion, which is much more luminous than a main sequence star. So it's about 18th magnitude. And in outbursts, it's 12th magnitude. So six magnitudes, that's you know, pretty large, but that's not, that's not as extreme as these typically are. They're typically 21st magnitude in quiescence and reach uh, 11th or 12th. So 10 magnitudes brightening is rather typical for the black hole. Very large amplitude and they're very rare. <clears throat> Whereas in the Nova case, Nova Sig, which is not a, classical nova, well, it, it undergoes outbursts. We've now seen four of them over the total history, 1938, 1956, 1983. And then in 2015, some of you may remember this, it was all over Sky and Tell and all over, it was on the front page of the New York Times, if I remember correctly. It went through two enormous outbursts uh, in 2015. And is what was then, I think, reaching 10th or 11th magnitude. So very, very bright, but you gotta wait a long time to see them. Okay, um, very quickly, I should be keeping track of the time, which of course doesn't show on my screen here because it's all covered with Zoom. Uh, well, oh, okay, I've got a clock running, I can see that. So we can summarize the whole landscape for what you can do if you have 100 years of data. And this has become a, a fairly classical way of getting a big picture view. You can talk about absolute magnitudes, which is how intrinsically bright an object is, versus the time scale that it's varying on. <clears throat> and it, you can put supernovae in here, you can put blazars, which is a class of quasars that we've all heard about, and quasars themselves produce flares, but the biggest, most whopping flares, I mean, look at these absolute magnitudes, to remind us all of it, what an absolute magnitude means, the absolute magnitude of our Milky Way galaxy, just taken as the luminosity of the uh, <clears throat> 10 to the 12 stars in our galaxy is about minus 20. So blazar flares reach up to minus 30, 10 magnitudes, which is a factor of 10,000 in brightness. So enormously luminous things. Um, <clears throat> The black hole LMXBs that motivated me and many other people for wanting to look at uh, long time scales, because these are fascinating objects, they don't get all that bright in their absolute magnitude, only about minus two or so, as you can see here. But you have to wait in round numbers about 100 years for one to pop off again. So if you want to study them, you need long stretches of data. <clears throat> 
And things that are much more familiar to you, I'm sure, dwarf novae, cataclysmic variables, live over here. They're not as luminous as these. They're not as luminous by far as novae, classical novae, recurrent novae, or just uh, normal novae, which I guess I didn't put on here. But they're the same typical <clears throat> absolute magnitude as recurrent novae. And flare stars, which some of you may have looked at, A.D. Leo, classic flare star, um, YZ Canis Minoris, if I'm remembering right. There's some stars that are flaring all the time. They're M dwarfs, and they're not very luminous, but you don't have to wait very long to watch something go bang in the night, right? Whereas these things, you have, you have to wait a decade or 100 years. Okay, um, here's what we built in Bob Simcoe was the creator and I'll describe it very quickly so we can get to the science. <clears throat> what we do is we put two glass plates down on this loading table here. Steve can tell you all about how this works because he's a master at uh, operating this thing. And when you push the go button, this whole uh, uh, plate um, uh, loading facility slides inwards. It goes zoop in here so that the plates which are sitting here and here are in underneath these uh, open windows. Up on top here is a telecentric lens. It is a, a very high quality Zeiss lens and it is imaging one to one, no, no magnification. Uh, the image of a 40 by 40 millimeter uh, region of the plate onto a 40 by 40 millimeter CCD up here. A very fast readout CCD, <clears throat> not like what we use in telescopes uh, today, which are much slower in readout. This was all designed back in the, in the 1990s, the very fast readout, which was a technical challenge, just as recent as that. Um, to do rapid scanning of, believe it or not, uh, large area displays. Yes, I'm sure uh, many of you will remember that in the 1990s, if you wanted to go to uh, Costco, I don't even remember if Costco was in business in the 90s, but let's assume they were, and, and buy a big screen TV, uh, you had to lay out enormous sums by today's standards, you know, $10,000 or something to get a 40 inch screen. Or, so they were very expensive in their early days. Maybe it was the 80s. I'm, Let's not worry about the dates. So it was worth technology being invested in how you could find the dead pixels in your beautiful uh, large area display and repair them. I don't know how they were repaired, but they were possible to repair. You didn't throw the whole screen away if you had a few bad pixels here and there, which of course the customer would say, this thing is, you know, this is, this is a, not a beautiful image. So that's what motivated designing uh, this, this fast camera and the precision in X and Y uh, in able to move appreciable mass. Uh, your big flat panel screen is, we all know how, you know, they're not heavy, but they're not light either. See, but if you, were, if you were scanning, looking for bad pixels, you had to move it very rapidly and very precisely. So this XY table moves, in our case, uh, roughly 25, 30 pounds, we'll use those numbers, uh, units rather, uh, this whole fixture uh, very quickly and very precisely. Because what we're doing is we have, and I'll, I, there's a link to a video here, right here on this site, uh, on this page. I'll send Steve this file. You can download it yourself, or you can go to the DASH website, which was on the first page. Um, so what we do then is we go tick, tick, well, <laughs> can't move the mouse, uh, tick, 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 except in tiny steps, uh, 40 millimeter steps, to move the plates underneath the fixed telecentric lens and CCD and take an image. There's no shutter on this camera. Uh, the room lights are dark, but we're looking at a bright light source, an LED array that Bob Simcoe built by hand, believe it or not. A big cluster of LEDs, very bright LEDs that are pulsed. And so you see a flash of light, which shining up through the glass plate. 
and in focus focused by the telecentric lens on the CCD for one-to-one -one magnification. And the images overlap so that you uh, get double images of almost every star, or at least the ones around the edge. Um, and that's, that's how it works. But the precision still uh, amazes me what was possible to develop in the 80s or 90s. This is being moved with precision on where you were and where you moved to that is uh, at the micron level, several microns. The reason we needed that is we are digitizing into 11 mic micron pixels on the CCD. And the last thing you want is to have slop in where you've taken your image so that you are not registering it in pixels in a linear and correct way. I'm sure that will make sense to many of you. So it's an extreme requirement and this is more than met it. Um, it, works, it works beautifully. So here is the sequence of telecentric lens images, the LED array flashes, and the table then moves. The exposure time is only of, of order three tenths of a second. There's no shutter. And the exposure time is calculated when the plates are loaded by the photo density of the plate, the mean density, how gray, how dark, how white, how transparent is the plate. All of that is computed on, in real time so that the exposure time can be automatically adjusted to how gray or dark, if you want to think of it that way, the plates are. Okay, so that's the hardware. It's uh, beautiful, it's working. There is another incredible piece of hardware that Bob Simcoe designed, in which I don't, don't have time to show you. But we realized that to do a half a million plates, uh, every plate has to be cleaned on the back side, on the clear glass side, because they, the image I showed you way back of uh, numbers and arrows and lines and whatnot, all of that's got to be removed. That would totally interfere with the uh, image, <laughs> images that you're wanting to measure. And it's every star on the plate or galaxy or whatever you are looking at that you want to be able to record. So the, the, um, the pipeline is pretty vast and there isn't time to go through this, uh, but you can stare at it and, and uh, we can talk about it if you have questions when we're finished, but I think just to keep on time, I better keep going here. But it's a multi-step uh, series of things that have to be done. And I'm mentioning all this because the other way that I and we all wanted to make this project work was we weren't going to go and just scan half a million plates and then spend the next 10 years after trying to figure out what's on them. The processing of the plates, and a typical plate, I should have mentioned this, will have 20,000 detectable stars on it, 30,000. Some plates have 100,000, the deep plates, the high resolution plates, um, every one of which has its magnitude measured. Okay. So you've got to have a very efficient, very fast pipeline to do all of the things you have to do. You have to do the astrometry. You have to know where you're looking so that you know where your calibration stars are. Uh, you have to do the whole coordinate solution on the plate, knowing where all those uh, Hubble Guide stars or the APAS stars are. Now we're using something called Atlas from Pan Stars and Gaia. <clears throat> but all of that has to be done. And so the goal was that Every plate that is scanned on a given day is processed to make it, you know, sort of sound like you could do it all in a 24 hour day is processed that night. Now we don't do it on the night of the same day, but we do it at that same rate. Ed downloads, uploads the data from disks that we have uh, uh, at our site at Harvard uh, to a very fast supercomputer that Harvard has where we do all the processing. We need lots of cores, you know, a big machine. So we have uh, a big chunk of machine to do this. Okay, let's quickly move on. So <clears throat> here uh, is the sky that we have released. This plot, this is a uh, map that some of you will be familiar with in galactic coordinates, not in our right ascension and declination. Most of us in astronomy like to think in these units of where you are in the galaxy. Here's the galactic plane, there's the galactic center, that's the north galactic pole, that's the south galactic pole. So by, uh, <clears throat> by uh, 
January of 2017, I was just looking for the date here, we had released the Northern Galactic Hemisphere. We were in, originally intending to keep releasing these 15 degree slices of in, in galactic latitude um, all the way down to the South Galactic Pole. I decided we would hold off on releasing the Southern Galactic half until we had really completed the whole survey and released everything at once, all reprocessed. The reason for that was we were changing our catalogs for calibration from GSC to APAS, now to ATEL, improving our software for both the photometry and astrometry, and we're still making those improvements. So it, it, people have plenty of sky to look at their favorite objects in to uh, use now and since 2017. And we release these roughly every month or two, few months, uh, these slices in 15 degree wedges. So there's a huge amount of data. Lots of people have been making use of it, but the whole sky will be released <clears throat> later this coming year. I won't take the time to talk about the calibration because we're running short on time, but let me just mention for those of you, some of you may be using CCDs and doing your own photometry. Uh, and if you're, if anybody is still taking uh, actual photographic images with a CCD, but whatever, you have to worry about vignetting. You don't get the same amount of light for your, if your object of interest is out here near the corners of your plate or your CCD that you would get if it's in the center. Optics are not uniformly flat. So we do the analysis in concentric rings or we divide the, uh, the image into concentric rings to take into account this vignetting and we <clears throat> use our calibration stars, look at their distribution in a given ring. We also, on top of this, adopt another set of, um, of cells to divide our image into. 50 by 50 local bins. So we got one, two, three, four, five, you know, all up to 50, 50 in X and 50 in Y. And we do that because there are other things that you want to take into account. The plates, because they're all photographic plates, may not be uniform in their sensitivity. The emulsions in the early days, 1885, 86, 1895, were not as high quality as they were by the 1930s or 40s or right up to 1965 in round numbers 62 summers in there which is when the plate taking no it's more like 65 or 66. Um, in fact it was later than that i'm just remembering because i i showed up at harvard in 67 as a graduate for as a graduate student and the plate taking was still going on and so in fact it uh, it stopped in the early 70s, it must have been, or the late, very late 60s. But anyway, so dividing it into this grid means you can do all another neat thing. Uh, the plates have enormous fields of view, the patrol plates. They might be 50 by 50 degrees, you know, huge chunk of sky. Well, you may have a cloud over here and another cloud over there. And because you're doing the astrometry, uh, sorry, the photometry locally, you can, uh, you can adjust for that because in every one of these local bins, you're looking at how well the calibration stars or stars whose magnitude you know from uh, the fact that they're all cataloged and most of them are not variable, uh, you can adjust for what they should have been uh, due to local uh, transparency effects. So none of that was something we thought would be possible, but it was possible. Here's the promised photo of what I'm calling here the core team, and that's an unfair label because there are a couple of other uh, people who should have been in this photograph. I don't remember who took this, but uh, Lindsay, our curator, should have been standing right here in the middle. She's organizing it all. There's Ed, who's on this uh, Zoom, and there's Ray, and there is your um, wonderful president of skyscrapers. And, I won't take the time to identify everybody else. This is Bob Simcoe, the incredible mechanical electrical engineer. This guy is just amazing what he can design and has built this whole top end of the scanner and the plate cleaning machine that you're not gonna to get to hear about, but it's an incredible machine or it was, it's now in storage. It's in storage because it could not be used to do the four by five plates or the 
14 by 17 plates. So we're done with all the eight by tens that the machine was designed for. Okay, and here's the whole team just to get everybody on board. And where is Lindsay? Come on, my, here, here's Lindsay. And you can see this is taken recently because everybody's masked up except for Ed and me. I was sitting at home when this was took, taken or whatever. But we have, a, we have a great team of scanners. They're all part-time people. And uh, it's, the scanning is still going on. And it was certainly uh, difficult to organize with all the COVID things we had to worry about. But it's going on. And, and we hope to finish this summer. And what have we done? Well, here it is. Um, this is in units of 100,000. There's a one missing there. This should be 10 to the fifth. Okay, and so in 2020, which is where we are, of course, you can see that the tick marks here are in, in uh, half year units. So this is, this is basically August of 2020, and we're up at uh, 400. Uh, well, the 400,000th plate was in August. I don't remember the exact day in August, but it was in August. And so we're beyond that. I think it's of order to 420,000 now, but okay. Quickly, very quickly, um, what have we discovered with this? Um, and this is, these are early science results that were done back in the 2012, 2013 era. The graduate student of mine, Suman Tang, uh, discovered that things that we thought we understood, red giants that are not yet in a pulsation phase, um, undergo uh, remarkable dips in brightness. These are not, some of you may have heard of something, a class called T-core Bohr stars, which are, or R-core Bohr stars, which are, have dips that look similar to this, but not like this, this is new. So we just we discovered fairly early on a new type of variability in what we thought we understood, you know, red giants, which are, and, uh, these are in a very narrow band of spectral type or in temperature, uh, and, and they, it's not just a single star. There's a whole group of these that, that were found, all with almost the same identical temperature. And I don't think anybody has made <laughs> proper sense of this yet. We found uh, an example, we think, uh, of something that is accretion, which we're going to talk about in the next five minutes here, uh, but not onto a compact object. This is a K, a K giant star, K5 luminosity class three, accreting onto an F star, a main sequence F star. Well, this, this K giant, uh, similar to the ones we were just looking at in the last slide, does emit dust, which is probably what we were seeing on the uh, on the previous slide. But here's a giant in a binary. And what we think is happening is that this F star is accreting dust from the K giant. And it's changing the brightness of the F star, which is uh, what we're seeing in these light curves. So that is something that is totally new, uh, accretion of dust, changing the optical brightness of the star. Some of you may have heard about symbiotic stars, which are a very interesting class of variables. Uh, they may or may not be related to something that after all these many decades, we still don't understand, the type 1a supernovae, which are fundamental for <laughs> understanding the very early universe. Um, well, this, this is a symbiotic star that underwent a big outburst by normal standards. It's not as bright as a nova in its, or as many magnitudes increase, but a symbiotic star does not normally do this. And so we were able to relate that to uh, type 1As. <clears throat> okay, for the last five minutes, because I'm going over time, I don't know what, did anybody note, Steve, did you note the time we started? I guess it's my clock on the Zoom here is giving me Probably not the time that I've been speaking, but the time since I was... Hi, hi Josh. Yeah, we, it looked like you started about 20 past uh, 7. Okay. Well, the trouble is... Okay. Okay, then it's not so bad. Well, I'm still getting... Yeah, we're, 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 we want to wind this up soon. 
So back to the binaries, the, the black hole low mass X-ray binaries. There are about 25 <clears throat> to 40, actually now more like 40 of these uh, that have been discovered, all discovered in X-rays. They undergo these huge outbursts that I've mentioned. Um, so they're, they're detectable in X-rays or discovered in X-rays, and they're very bright in the optical for a very small fraction of the time that we call the duty cycle. <clears throat> It's the fraction of the source on time. And I'll give it to you in round numbers. The duration of the outburst of one of these uh, binaries, it's a black hole accreting from a normal star, typically only a very uh, common kind of star, but one I'll get to very quickly here, that we would never expect to wind up as a partner with a black hole. <laughs> um, so it's that duty cycle that we want to measure because these, these systems, my computer is okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of one of these. Or as I just said on this slide, there are about 18 to 20 now, uh, maybe 21. Very, um, the very short duration of, of order weeks to perhaps a month at most, um, and they're they're companions. We call them low mass X-ray binaries. Not because the black hole is low mass. No, it's, it's not. It's typically eight times the mass of our sun. But it's being fed by Roche lobe overflow, same thing that happens in a cataclysmic variable, by a 0.5 solar mass K dwarf, the K star. So redder, much less luminous than our sun, which is a G star. But these things almost universally, it's like they, they came out of a, a factory. They're all K3 or K4 dwarfs. And um, since before what we've been doing with DASH, uh, well, as the whole discovery has gone on, very few had been seen to go off more than once. When we started DASH, only two had known previous outbursts. Nova Sig, 1938 that I mentioned, was discovered, thought to be a classical nova, and then when it went off in 1980. 88, 50 years later, uh, it was discovered in x-rays. And that's not the way classical novae look. So um, this is what one of these would look like if you could get in your Starship Enterprise and get up close to it. And this is, this is an accurate computer model of what this particular uh, black hole system is, right ascension declination. It's a, uh, a, uh, a F star companion, which is not a K dwarf, and it's feeding an accretion disk, which produces jets when this outburst goes off, uh, similar to what quasars and blazars do. Okay, so the reason that these are so interesting is because they are so improbable. Or this, there are lots of reasons they're interesting, but it is the whole story of how do you make these things? How do you get a, a, a flyweight star as a binary companion to a massive thing, a black hole, which has evolved from a very, very massive star, probably uh, 30 solar masses. A star that massive doesn't typically have a K dwarf companion. In fact, we've never seen one that has a K dwarf companion. So I won't take the time, there isn't time to talk about the prevailing theory, which has uh, been around for decades, but, most of the community doesn't believe it, or certainly I don't believe it, because it doesn't really work, and there isn't time to talk about why it doesn't work. So let's get on to showing you what Dash was able to do. Here is the same system that I showed you the cartoon image of, 16, um, 1655 minus 40. Here's an image, and this is shown as if it were a positive image. As I've already said, they're, they're actually photonegatives. June 16th. There's no star at the position. We know the position very precisely because it went off and was discovered in this particular case in the 1990s. It was 1992 when this was discovered, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, so, you know, there weren't plates. The plates are typically available for a given region of sky where this thing would be every roughly week or so. It would be a typical uh, cadence that you might have. Uh, but there is no, the plates were taken not on a fixed time schedule, which is actually very good for variability studies. So on August 27th, my God, there's something there that wasn't there then. 
it's there the next day, which is what should be, but by September 30th, it was gone. And this is precisely at the right position. So he, this became the first of the dash discovered historic outbursts. We then went on to find uh, four more, and I'm not going to take the time to go through them in detail, but this, these are the light curves that you can plot for yourself when I give an object that in this case was a known variable star. It had been discovered as a variable, but nobody had a clue that it was one of these black hole systems until it went bang and went off in x-rays, which a normal variable star does not do. And when it gets very bright in x-rays, it increases its optical brightness, in this case only by a, a few magnitudes. This is not nearly as dramatic as what we saw in the previous one or what most of these are. And the reason is that in this case, <clears throat> it has, a, like the, the one I just showed you, a fairly bright companion. So it's not the typical k door. Here's one that went off in 2000, discovered in 2000, <clears throat> and it's remarkable because it's up in the halo of our galaxy. Which, is, which none had been seen in. This is not where O stars live, as some of you probably know. They live in OB associations, which are definitely not up in the halo of the galaxy. So how did this black hole, this is now a dynamically confirmed black hole with a very low mass companion, how did it get up in the halo? Uh, these are all the big questions. And here is its outburst in 1928, showing this outburst lasting for months. Okay, and so forth. And there, since I made this slide, there are actually about three more on here that we have found. <clears throat> Some really remarkable ones. I should have updated the slide. <clears throat> so for the last part of this talk, just in the last minute or two, since we're out of time, it's um, remarkable that we see these black holes doing this. Are there anything else that is in the X-ray binary class that does something similar? And the answer is yes, there are neutron stars that undergo these outbursts, which we'd known about longer than the black hole case. And so what this plot is showing you is the, <clears throat> um, well, this is showing you the, for the four systems I was just mentioning that I won't bother to read off the names for, but this is, this is one we started with. And this is the one we just looked at. This is showing you the something else that we have to measure, and that is how much time were we able to look at that particular object just because of the random, random nature of the plates being taken and how deep they were. So this shows in yellow showing you when we would have detected an outburst. And in some of these systems like V404 SIG here, many of the plates were not deep enough to have detected an outburst. All that has to go in to deriving what we call the duty cycle, which is what is being plotted here. And I don't think there's time to explain this plot, but what I want you to take away is that the mean here of these four first four systems has a cumulative distribution here for the duty cycle that's showing you the probability of detecting an event versus what the duty cycle is. So this is telling you straight away that it's roughly 1%. Uh, when you just average those four objects together. If you, and indeed, that's what the more detailed analysis of in, uh, these four objects gives. 1.6% of the time these things are detectable. The rest of the time they're in quiescence. And <clears throat> if you compare them with neutron stars, which we've known about much longer than black holes in, in, in X-ray binary systems, they're about 10 times larger. The same, same kind of objects. They have very similar companions, K dwarfs typically, but instead of 1.6%, this is like 11%. So it's a factor of seven or so larger. And from just those two measurements, one can deduce something about the relative numbers of black holes versus neutron stars that are being produced to do this. And that is something that is much larger than we used to think that you would make that many black holes. And fortunately, theory has now caught up with this. Uh, and what this plot is showing is if it's green, you make a neutron star. And if it's black, you make a black hole. We used to think that any mass above 20 solar masses for the progenitor star made black holes. Well, indeed, you get uh, more and more 
uh, black above 20, but it isn't an on off switch. It's a probabilistic thing, whether you make an intron star or a black hole. So <clears throat> all of this is going to be possible to constrain and what is really the real bottom line of this whole black hole story is that we're by measuring the numbers of these things, we're going to be able to determine whether you can make them by this prevailing model, which I told you I didn't believe could account for them. And the answer is you can't. So finally, for one more minute, uh, we're really out of time. This whole uh, Dash database uh, says, yes, we can detect, and this is the only uh, instrument or project that's detected these historic outbursts. You can't go backwards in time, obviously, and detect them any other way. So it's only from Dash that we can, that we can make this measurement. So <clears throat> the, the question then becomes, well, since every one of these black hole systems or, and neutron star systems were discovered in, in X-rays, why don't we look for them in the optical? Because we got a hundred years of data and we're verifying them as uh, for what they are by their outbursts. So we started looking and here's the first one we found, which looks when you expand the light curve, which I think is what the next slide shows you. Well, it isn't that expanded, but it's a very similar, <laughs> this is a very coarse time scale. Uh, a very similar range in outburst. You can see it's going from 17th magnitude up to eighth magnitude, eight magnitudes. That's a very healthy outburst. That's a typical for a NOVA system. This might be a NOVA. There were no X-ray detectors in space in 1945, so it wasn't possible to look at. There's not been an outburst at this position in the current era of X-ray detectors. So, and there are lots of others. Here's another one. This could easily be a black hole system. Here's, here's a, still another one here. And that's what we are, and Ed has got a wonderful pipeline that uh, we were running before COVID hit roughly once a month. Ed has started running it again. I haven't had time to get back onto that, but we'll soon. So we can discover these things. And the only way to prove that they're black holes is to go out with big telescopes because they're very, very faint when they're in quiescence and get spectra. But that's something that can be done. And we've started doing that. And here are examples of one. This one looks actually very much like a black hole system. It has double peaked H alpha emission, which is unusual. And uh, there's a blow up of that same system. So there's a lot to do. And I'm going to leave it there because we have run out of time. The last thing, I'll just flip through the slides so you can see that it's not just black holes in binaries, it's black holes in quasars that also do interesting variability. Here's the very first quasar ever discovered, 3C273, discovered by uh, uh, Martin Schmidt, famous Cal Caltech astronomer, still around at Caltech, an amazing guy. And he discovered this from the 3C radio catalog, third Cambridge, you know, the other Cambridge. And uh, these variable radio stars, they didn't know what they were. Well, they turned out to be quasars and they were variable and variability was discovered within weeks of the announcement uh, of the discovery of 3C273, discovered from the Harvard plates because the light curve wasn't constant. Well, here's the dash light curve of 3C273. You can see there's an enormous dip here, dip and, and period of outburst and lots of variability going on on time scales as quick as short as a few days. If you plot it in uh, easier to read units with dimmed data, it looks pretty impressive. You compare the, the object, which is this object here, with comparison stars of very similar to magnitude, which of course you've always got on the plate. And this shows you that the photometry is beautiful. Look at this. Here's a normal star that's not going anywhere. And there's 3C273. And so you can do a periodogram analysis. Look for the time scale on which the object is varied. And lo and behold, there's a 16 year time scale for this object, which is very significant. This is 99% false alarm probability. So all of this stuff is real, but it's probably largely red noise. But this is way out of the realm. And the comparison stars, all the reference stars down here, 
don't exceed their 99% probability. They're all behaving like nice, ordinary, dull stars that are not variable. So this thing is really remarkable. And the incredible thing is that in VLBI radio observations of 3CT73, there was a very similar time scale picked up. And finally, the very last object, different, but a, a blazar that's even more variable than what we've just been looking at. This is a well-known object that some of you may even have been looking at. It's had a recent big outburst in the optical. Getting It's bright to begin with. You can do this from your backyard. This is OJ287, which is from the Harvard plates, thought to be a 12-year uh, binary black hole system. This was worked on before DASH, just the old hard slog through the plates. And we do not confirm a 12-year period. Uh, that doesn't stand out in this periodogram analysis. As you can see in this same similar kind of analysis that I showed you for 273, this is where the claimed 1995 paper from the Czech group would be. And there are big peaks here, but not this is not you know, uh, an outstanding feature. Okay, so I've gone on too long. I'm gonna stop here, but DASH can do a lot of things and we're getting near the end of the scanning and all the data will be out there within the next year. So let me stop here. And if there's time for questions, I'm happy to answer any that you have. So any questions, please. Yeah, I have a, I have a question about the object that was discovered in the halo. Of the galaxy. Okay. Yeah, no, the halo of um, our galaxy. Yeah. The, um, and you said it was just shouldn't be there. Um, yeah. Has there, been, has there been any work done on proper motion of that star? And is it just um, traveling to the halo of the galaxy? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And Gaia uh, is, of course, measuring proper motions exquisitely, although it's not been up long enough perhaps to have measured it uh, for this star, but that's an excellent question. I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know the answer, but it would be easy to look up. <laughs> and yes, the only reason it could be in the halo is that it was shot up there. There was, it, this is a binary system and binary, binary interactions are well known for uh, ejecting uh, objects. Uh, if it's a really tangled mess, you can you can kick one of the binaries, or the binary can exchange with uh, another star in the other binary, and that would yes give rise to large velocities and probably proper motion. But that's a very good question. Uh, Thanks. Thanks. Um, I I have another observation. Yeah. And that is when you showed the... Now I see my Zoom screen. Thanks for being there. Is that <laughs> just yeah, I... dropped off my... Yes, okay. keep going. You, sh you showed the curve of uh, numbers of uh, plates yeah. that uh, were, were uh, scanned over the period of time. Yeah. And um, there's a flat line region yes. in 2016. Yes, I was going to comment on that. <laughs> I that, thought you might mention that. No, no, I, I did intend to mention it, but I was going on. I knew I was going to be short on time getting to what I wanted to get to. That was the flood, which I'll bet Steve has told at least some of you about. We had a water pipe, 60 pounds of pressure of Cambridge water supply, eight inch diameter, if I'm remembering the numbers right, pipe burst right outside the D building of the observatory, which is the plates storage building. Uh, it was a sufficiently powerful jet of water. That's a lot of pressure from a large volume of water that uh, my interpretation of what I know happened is that it was like a, uh, like a drill. It, it tunneled its way through the brick and got into uh, a duct system inside the building, which connected up to the floor below the plate stacks. And as uh, as Steve knows, water filled this sub-basement. It's not, and there's no real basement, it's just the ground floor, but it's sort of at basement level. And there's about a seven foot high crawl space underneath that with massive concrete um, beams that are supporting the whole building there. But 
the water got up to the top of that six or seven foot crawl space, popped the hatches, you know, they're hatches that you could pull up from the floor and just kept rising until it was discovered. I was observing at the uh, observatory on the MMT telescope, a big telescope we have in, in Arizona with, uh, with a graduate student and looking in fact at black hole candidates that we'd found from DASH. And I got a call at 7.30 in the morning when we were, you know, it was, it, the sun was up, we were finishing the run, we closing, but Arizona is, you know, two hours later. So we were closing everything up with the operator on the top of Mount Hopkins and south of Tucson. And it was Lindsay who says, Josh, you better come down here. <laughs> and Charlie Hickey, who Steve must remember, great guy who's the building super, you could think of him as being, he maintains and he's got a whole army of guys working for him. Uh, and it was a disaster, you know. So I, I wanted to go down and see what our precious plates were being exposed to. And Charlie said, you're not going down those stairs because we had computers that were all now underwater and it would all be, you know, an electrical hazard to go into that environment. So I didn't go down, nobody went down. And by the end of that day, this was January 16th, if I'm remembering the date right, and it was, what was the year? We could go back and look at the slide, but I'm not gonna take the time. I think it was Martin Luther King's birthday, if I remember. Yeah, I think it was, birthday. it was, yeah. So that later that day, Cambridge, of course, or somebody provided, maybe it was Harvard, I don't know, found, provided a pump truck and they, the water, they shut off the, you know, the Cambridge water supply. That, that they did as soon as they discovered this had happened. But then it was too late because the bottom three feet of shelving and therefore plates was all underwater. And that was a disaster that we took many months to recover from, but, uh, but we did recover. It was yeah, Martin Luther King Day. And by April of that year, we were getting plates back from a company that specializes in disaster recoveries. They were normally used to, you know, reprocessing in whatever way they could paper documents, but they also had done some things with glass. But we had to devise, and we had fortunately a very good group at Harvard that were people in conservation. So they, they knew exactly what to do. And so we put together a whole procedure. They're up in Northern Massachusetts and they spent six months in round numbers dealing with 60,000 plates that had been submerged. And those have all been scanned and uh, they did not lose their scientific uh, uh, merit. They were perfectly good. There, was, there are some detectable changes, but not major. So anyway, that's a long answer to, <laughs> to a short question. If, if not, I, I, Josh, I have to apologize because I was trying to rush through uh, getting, uh, getting through my introduction to you. But I do want everyone to know that just this year, you were awarded a legacy um, fellowship by the American Astronomical yeah. Society. The, the American Astronomical Society decided it was time for them to have uh, the equivalent of what the American Physical Society has to be a fellow in the society. And so they invented this new category and they started with, you know, I think the old fogies first, <laughs> which I guess I've already become. Um, and, and then they'll work their way down, you know, but yeah, that was, that was nice. I already was, or am a fellow of the American physics or physical society, but so the astronomical society decided it was time to catch up. <clears throat> well, folks, um, Josh, I want to thank you very, very much. Um, You're very welcome. No, for, I uh, for taking the time to come speak to us. And uh, hopefully I will see you at some point in the future. Yeah, well, I certainly hope so. You and Ray both, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, Lindsay, Lindsay says we can't get in yeah. because we don't have Harvard IDs. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very tight control. And uh, I just asked, do you remember Andrea Moore, our administrator? Maybe you never met her. 
but I don't think I did. She's very good. And I just today, because of a, a question that Lindsay had, I, I asked her, which you would have thought I might have asked her, any one of us could have asked, have there been any COVID cases at the observatory? Uh, I don't know of any, but it, you know, but nobody's in there. It's it's uh, it's in lockdown mode. You can go in. A very a complicated procedure. You have to you have to uh, in effect log in before you go in with your computer, or you can do it from your phone into a special special key and all this stuff. So you can't just walk in the building, right? Of course, the building is locked, but your your ID card won't even get you in unless you go through all these steps. But it gradually, uh, I mean, so then you may have thought, well, how could we be scanning still, which or scanning now, which we are doing? And the answer is you go through these steps and you can come in, but it's a very controlled process. And we had to write uh, a special proposal to convince the Harvard health people uh, and a whole team put together to deal with the COVID thing that uh, we would be operating in a safe way. You know, it's, it's not sufficient to have people just wearing masks and being six feet apart. There's more considerations than that. And so all of this has to go on. And so the labs, and uh, I, want, I wanted to make sure that Dash was right in there, which we were. And I have another lab that I may have told you about at one point, an x-ray detector lab that we also wanted to get back on the air but uh, so the labs are working, but uh, very few people are coming into their offices. And it's taking a terrible toll on people that are only there for a limited time, like postdoctoral fellows. You know, you got a two year fellowship and you can't come in, and work from home. You know, it's not the same as being there in the midst of things. So everything is done by Zoom all the, all the colloquiums, all the uh, lunchtime talks, all the everything. So. Which is, you know, a lot better than nothing. I mean, it would be, <laughs> be really bad if there was nothing happening. But hopefully by, I don't know when, maybe next summer, uh, things will start opening up. Well, again, thank you very much. And You're very welcome. Uh, hopefully we can get you down to the real observatory some days. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, I'd like to see it, yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for attending our meeting.